Hello and welcome to my podcast. Do me a favor, subscribe to the John Con Report. Wherever you hear your podcast, you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. You can find us there as part of Empire Media, A-M-P-I-R-E. Always much appreciated when you tune in. And don't forget, you can read my work on ESPN.com. I have a story up, probably, I guess it'll go up Saturday, on Jaden Daniels and the first start. The most anticipated start by a quarterback here, I think, since Robert Griffin III in 2012. What guy, what teammates are saying about him? They are more pumped up for him. And I know none of these guys were here when Griffin was here, but it's different, folks. And so um, there you go. So anyways, that'll be up on Saturday on ESPN.com. Also, as a reminder, for you gold members on Friday night, I'll be doing the private Zoom session with former Washington receiver, Redskins receiver, Santana Moss. So Santana is going to join us. You know, the, the Zoom starts, I think, for the gold members around 7.20. Santana will be joining us at 7.30. So you're going to get a half hour with Santana to ask him whatever questions you want. If you want to become a gold member and join this little Zoom session, then just go to Empire Media YouTube page, click on the word join, and then go from there. Anyway, so and then that'll be available after the gold members get their private Zoom session with him. That'll be available to the rest of the members. So anyway, there you go. So in a few minutes, I'll be joined by ESPN's Jenna Lane to talk about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. She has covered them for a while. She knows the team very well. And I think you just need to get ready for the first game and you need to know the opponent. It is a interesting team because they do, what do they do defensively with all the blitzes? But also there's a lot of new parts, a new receiver that people are down there excited about. Why is Baker Mayfield found maybe a home there? And, you know, a few other things to go into with, with Jenna. So stay tuned for that. Now, a couple before we get to that point, just a couple things from practice on Thursday. And you may have seen the injury report already. Um, one, Johnny Newton did not practice. Marcus Mariota did not practice. He's got a, Mariota has a chest injury. This is why, it's a good reason why they you know, kept Jeff Driscoll, because they're going to need a veteran to, to go in there if something was with Mariota and he had the groin issue at the end of camp. Now it's an upper, I think it's a chest injury. That's what they list him as. So I don't, I don't think it's anything long-term, and, but there's a chance it's going to keep him out of Sunday, which is why it's good that Driscoll is here. So that's one thing. Then um, with Johnny Newton, we told you that he was going to go on Wednesday, and he did. He was going to be limited on Thursday, but it, he was listed as not practicing. And then he's supposed to go on Friday to determine whether or not he's going to play. I still say it's really hard to see him going in there and playing and being effective given how little work he's actually done since he arrived in Washington, to be honest. So that goes back to the spring, and it's also in the summer. That's the difference between he and Brandon Coleman because Coleman's been out there. But Coleman, I will say, like when you look at that situation with the left tackle, Cornelius Lucas has been the first guy out there in the drills with the starting, you know, so with the first group, that's he's the guy that's been going out there first. So I'd be surprised if, if, if anybody but Lucas starts that game on Sunday, but we'll see. So Coleman still has more to learn, but Lucas, again, has been the first guy in those drills when they're just doing some individual drills. They have the five out there. Lucas is the guy that's been at left tackle. So also a reminder on Saturday, I'll be doing another podcast. A lot of things that I've picked up during the week going to go over just why maybe these guys are very optimistic about the offense and why they feel like, and then just going over watching some of the Tampa blitzes from last year and how this team can beat that blitz, because that's a big key. And if you beat that blitz, you got some big plays available also. But the other key is Tampa is really good against the run. That's kind of the underrated thing here. I think their, their, their blitzes get a lot of attention, but it's their run defense that really is the key to that whole unit. But also some other things that maybe you, that I have picked up throughout the week, talking to guys in the locker room, Going to spill all that out on Saturday morning, so stay tuned for that. And again, gold members, private Zoom with Santana Moss, 7.30 Eastern time on Friday night. Friday night, jo- excuse me, you guys can join at 7.20. Santana comes on at 7.30. Get your questions in. Again, I will say, be efficient with your questions so we can get as many in as possible. So, um, so those of you who joined with Logan Paulson, I think you had a really good time back in June. I think you're going to have a really good time with Santana as well. Anyway, that's it from me. Here's now my conversation with ESPN's Jenna Lane talking about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. All right, Jenna, well, first of all, it's good to see you. Um, secondly, you're covering a team that's coming off another division title, nine and eight. What are the expectations for the Bucs this year? 
Well, it's great to see you as well. And in the words of Baker Mayfield, um, he had said it's about damn time, which <laughs> I think we can all agree on that because of it. It feels like it's been two years since the these teams last played a game. But as far as the expectations for this team goes, they were able to reach the, the playoffs this past year. Um, exceeded a lot of expectations. I don't think anybody had them going to the playoffs, winning the division, actually winning a playoff game over the Eagles in the wild card round. They lost to the Lions in the divisional round. I don't think anybody had the Bucks penciled in to do that, especially considering they had to play $80 million in dead money and also with a new quarterback in Baker Mayfield. But I think now for them, the burden of that that dead money, it's it's been lifted a little bit. And I think it's really about them going further. They want that Super Bowl. Obviously, every team says that at the beginning of every year. Are they capable of it? Well, we did see them, I think, exceed expectations, overperform this past year. I think it is quite possible because they did have they did make some upgrades in some important areas. But of course, other teams did that as well. So it's going to be going to be really, really interesting for them. But that's what they've been working towards all summer. Um, I know everybody's picking the Atlanta Falcons to kind of win the division based on the splashy moves that they've made. But like GM Jason Light said the other day, he's like, yeah, like everybody, please pick the Falcons. Like, I think they're actually enjoying this phase where they're now flying under the radar as opposed to being in the spotlight for three years with Tom Brady. That's right. Well, what are what would you say, looking at those upgrades, what are some of the biggest upgrades that they've made? Well, I think having a bona fide third receiver, and you and I talked about him off air for a, a moment, you know, they had Russell Gage this past year, and unfortunately, they lost him for the year to a knee injury. Before that, they had Julio Jones. He couldn't stay healthy. And before that, they had Antonio Brown, which they were able to win a Super Bowl with Brown, but you saw the way things ended for him in Tampa with him jogging off the field against the Jets. So just having that bona fide third receiver to take the weight off of Mike Evans and Chris Godwin I think has has been it's going to be huge for them. And, you know, really from the jump, what I saw from Jalen McMillan, who was, a I think, a steal of a third round pick out of Washington. And, um, you know, you talk to folks around the league and the Bucs certainly did. And, and they felt like they would have had no chance at this guy had he not had any injury his last year at Washington. But just the moment hasn't seemed too big for him. He's just kind of slid right in there and just every camp practice, just consistently making catches. It, you know, it, it seemed like he's been there already for such a long time. Mm. And in talking to him, I, I was able to have a couple sit downs with him actually. And what really impresses me about him too, is the fact that he's got a very high degree of maturity. And I think for a 22 year old guy, that's coming into such a big opportunity, that has all this talent, that's what you're kind of looking for when you, when you determine like, what's the trajectory of a guy and, you know, going back through some of my recollections of interviewing Chris Godwin pre-draft. And then when he was a rookie, it's very similar in terms of the whole time I'm talking to McMillan, I'm like, am I talking to a 60 year old man or am I talking to a 22 year old? Because it just, he seems to to really get that and you, not a guy you're going to have to worry about some of the kind of external stuff that happens when, when suddenly uh, a guy comes across a, a lot of money and, and the spotlight. So, um, which my favorite part about his story is the fact that his senior or his final year of college at UW, um, his grandmother actually moved in with him. So I, I love that. His grandmother moved in with him at UW, um, or was it his junior year? Uh, but his grandmother moved in with him at UW, um, and I just thought that that was fantastic. It, it, that, is, that is a cool story. And they also they had to attack the run game as well because that was an area where they weren't as strong last year. Rashad White, they go get Bucky Irving. What are you expecting from that? Yeah, that's going to be really interesting because I think that Bucky Irving may be the better – shouldn't say better, but in terms of like what the Bucks are needing, they've had a lot of tiptoeing in the backfield, a lot of dancing in the backfield. Some of that new system, like a completely different run game that was brought in this past year. And um, I think for a little while, like Rashad White just wasn't kind of identifying like the holes and stuff. I think he's had more success so far, like as a receiver, um, very, very good route runner. I think some of the best route running of any running back in the league but as far as a pure rusher, we're seeing things out of Bucky Irving, like the way he attacks these holes, the way he identifies them 
very quickly, I think could really benefit them. So, I mean, from the, from the beginning, I think you're going to see, you know, of course, Rashad's going to be the starter, but I think midway through the season, I think you're going to see them become more of a one, two punch. And I'm curious as to how much that kind of eats into white's carries just as a pure running back. Because again, I think Bucky might be, um, he might be more impactful as, as just that sheer runner. I think, um, I mean, he, he was, uh, and I know it's the preseason and I know that not every team is playing, you know, teams aren't playing their starters per se, but he just was mighty impressive in, in the preseason. So I'm, and this team desperately has needed a rushing attack. They were dead last in the league this past year. And, and that created quite a burden on, on that passing game, quite a burden on, on Baker. Speaking of Baker bounced around for a year or two goes there, has success. Why did he have success? And what are you expecting this year? The biggest thing Baker would tell you is that the Bucks allowed him to be himself. And I think there's also a strong dose of humility there too. And, and maturity. I mean, I talked to Chase McLaughlin as well, who's Mayfield's teammate here in Tampa, their kicker. He was with him in Cleveland and he, he, he said there, there was a certain amount of growing up that he kind of had to do. And look, I, I, I don't profess even at 39 years old, I don't profess to say all the right things all the time. And so I think it's important to think about that when we listen to comments from 20, 20 year olds that are suddenly thrust into the spotlight and, and they have all this pressure and these expectations on them. And you're coming to a place like Cleveland, which was known for so long as, as a losing team. And, and look, he did take them to the playoffs. Um, it ended the way it ended. But I think for him, you know, it was quite the journey going from, you know, Cleveland, Carolina, the Rams, you know, he just wanted an opportunity. And, you know, this this team, he's always been a confident guy and, and he's never been afraid of a challenge. I mean, he's a former walk on and, and guys will tell you he still has that mentality. He's still fighting. He still he still practices like he's fighting to make a roster, like he's fighting for his job. But I think. Um, you know, what, just what you've seen out of him is just a whole lot of grit and just heart. And, you know, even just the way he came into Tampa and just wanted to be part of the community. And this was a team, this is a community that had very little expectations post Tom Brady, because, Hey, like if you lose Tom Brady, you're, you're taking a big hole out of, out of this team. But um, I think it, it showed the strength of kind of their locker room, the way they rallied around Baker, but like he and his wife, Emily immediately identified that there were 40% of the students in Hillsborough County, which encompasses Tampa and some of the surrounding surrounding cities, you know, were qualifying for like free or reduced lunches and were, were living kind of below, um, the, I don't know, I don't know if you would call it the poverty line, but they identified that. And so they immediately, they started a foundation before he was even named a starter and they immediately, you know, started getting involved in the community. Like his wife, Emily would go to these, these early learning coalition centers that that's really kind of where their focus is on, on the kids that are like five and under and, you know, started volunteering there. And I just think that that really endeared themselves to the community. And, and then of course, you know, Baker goes out there and it, it takes them a while to figure out their identity, new offensive coordinator last year, but just kind of his toughness and his grit really won this this city over uh, just the way it, it did the locker room. And you talk to guys in the locker room, they love him. And I think his authenticity is the thing that they love and appreciate the most. He's never tried to be something that he's not. He said from the jump, I am not Tom Brady. I'm never going to be Tom, but he could be Baker. And, um, you know, they players really appreciate that. And I think now he talked about it now that they kind of have an identity. They kind of know who they are. And he's been paired with Liam Cohen, who was his offensive coordinator for five games with the Rams. You know, they developed a, a good chemistry. And the Bucks, even before they even resigned Baker to this long term deal, they sought his input on these offensive coordinator candidates, like who would be attractive for you to work with. And he was one of the guys. And so um, I think that that relationship, you know, I think when you're working with someone new that you've never worked with before, there's some growing pains that come with that. You know, sometimes you got to have a few arguments or tough conversations before you really, I think, build that connection. Well, they've, they've kind of already gone through that a little bit. And, and so there's already uh, more than a familiarity with each other. And, um, you know, I think that that's going to help him elevate his career. And I was talking to, to Thad Lewis, their quarterback's coach, and he's even seen it out on the field, you know, when he's a guy that, you know, he goes to make a play outside the pocket 
he's not just kind of looking for that first down marker to, to go out of bounds and get the down in this offense. Now he's, he's got his eyes downfield, which, you know, told, told Lewis, like this guy's ready to take the next step in this offense. And he fired off a deep shot. And that was very early on in camp too. So that just told him he's, he's ready. He's ready to build off of what he did last year. Defensively, that's where one of the things that people here will talk about, Jaden Daniels facing the Todd Bowles, the blitzing style of defense. What do you expect from the defense this year? And they, they are very aggressive. And They and are really I aggressive. Want to, like, I want to ask you, too, about the ends, too. But let's start in general. What are you expecting from Well, and that was honestly the topic of conversation on Monday when this team had a bonus practice because, I mean, what Daniel showed in the preseason, I mean, that 42-yard completion that he had on his first offensive series as a pro to De'Ami Brown, I mean, wow. Um, And then on top of that, 1,100 rushing yards this past year. You know, I feel like a lot of times guys become really good rushers as quarterbacks because maybe they don't have the arm. But like I was talking to Javier Thomas about that, who spent a long time in the AFC. He signed with the Bucks this offseason. He said the closest comparison he could he could think of with with Daniels would be Lamar Jackson. Just and as a defensive guy, like how do you stop that? Because you have to account for him as a runner. Oh, but at the same time, you know, you can't get too aggressive because otherwise he's going to kill you overhead. And that's the thing about this Todd Bowles defense is that while it is really aggressive up front, they are known for blitzing a lot. At the same time, they're also going to give up big plays. Like it's a high risk, high reward defense. And so if he can identify, you know, some of those, those shots, I mean, he could, he could really punish them overhead. You know, they're, they're trying of course to not have that be the case. And one of the things they did this off season was they reunited Jordan Whitehead with Antoine Winfield Jr., Winfield Jr. up until this morning was the highest paid defensive back in the NFL. Uh, but, you know, uh, with Whitehead, you know, he he came into Tampa. He was originally a, a draft pick by the Bucs, uh, was kind of considered a one trick pony back in the day, more of an in the box thumper type guy. But when he went to New York with the Jets, he, I think, was able to show um, more in coverage. And so now there's a lot more, I think, versatility that you're going to see. And the fact that those two communicate really well already, and there's already a strong familiarity, I think I think Bowles is going to be able to do a lot more uh, with them. But they've got some young guys like in their secondary. That that's one of my question marks. Like Tyke Smith, he is a rookie, a third round pick, somebody that Todd Bowles loves. Uh, he got a, a good look at him because his son uh, plays at at Georgia, Troy, um, and, and Smith was a teammate of his, and so. You know, but they're asking him to do a lot, you know, as he's a he's a nickel, but he's also a safety, too. Uh, that's a big responsibility for a rookie. They did have a rookie undrafted free agent Christian Isian at the nickel spot last year. But, you know, that that's certainly um, a big role uh, that he's going to have to fill there. But just a lot of of guys. I know you mentioned Ed Rusher. Um, you know, they have a lot of guys that they they parted ways with fixtures on the team that they've had younger ones step into now. Um Carlton Davis traded away to the Lions. So now they've got Zion McCollum, who had stepped in quite a bit last year because both um, Davis and, and also um, their other corner, you know, it just kind of really trying to, you know, fill that that void. Um, sorry, COVID brain. It got me for a second. It'll come to me in a minute. Jamel Dean. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I trust me. <laughs> I'll blame COVID that. brain gets me every once in a while still. And it, it's very frustrating. I had it in 2022. It still gets to me. But anywho, um, you know, now they've got Jamel Dean and they've got Zion McCollum, you know, but McCollum, you know, he wasn't a bona fide, like a true starter last year throughout the year. This is his first full year of, of starting. So how will he, how will he fill into that role? And then even the depth kind of behind him, again, it's a lot of, of kind of young, unproven guys. Um, and then, you know, you go to the middle of the field, no more Devin White, you know, they're going to have KJ Britt there, you know, and then at edge, they parted ways with Shaq Barrett and yeah, yeah, Diaby was injured this, this off season. He just started practicing again this week. What are we going to see from him? Joe Tryon Choyinka's never, never eclipsed the five, uh, the five sack mark for, for an outside linebacker. They didn't pick up the fifth year on his option. So he's, he's a guy that's kind of eager to prove himself and he's, he's slated to start. Last thing then, what is, what would you say then is, because the front seven has done a good job against the run in the past, correct? So what, what do you feel, is, is that the strength of this defense still is the ability to stop the run and why are they good at it? 
I, I think so. And it's it's kind of been their their backbone for the last several years. Um, and I think it's just general philosophy of of bulls being really aggressive up front. Um, you know, it, it it tends to just, you know, work hand in hand. If you're gonna be really aggressive and you're gonna have a lot of guys in the box, then then typically right. um you know, you're, you're, you're able to, to do a pretty decent job of that. Uh, whether that continues, I mean, they were one of these teams for a long time where their, their stats were kind of skewed because they were good at stopping the run because everybody knew that they could just kill them over the top. And so I think that that, you know, for a while that that's, that was kind of the, the, the word on this team, but, um, they've gotten better at kind of not just, um, you know, kind of eliminating those explosive pass plays, but also in interceptions, that's something that, I mean, McCollum, for instance, told me he bought a jugs machine this off season because he wanted to work on his ball skills. And I told that to Antoine, Antoine's like, I, I didn't think of doing that. I, now I need to do that. Um, but you know, that's the thing, this team, you know, the talk was that they had a good defense. And I know, I know Daniels had actually talked about that um, this week, but they, they weren't getting the takeaways and that's, when you talk about good secondaries, that's what they're known for. They're known for the takeaways. We did see we did see quite a few of them this this uh, training camp, and so I think that that's encouraging. But you know, I mean, that's that's really what it's about, um, especially if you're a high risk, high reward defense where you're going to give up some big plays. If you're going to do that, you better get the ball back. Absolutely, Jenna. Thank you very much. Tell people where they can follow you leading up to this game, so they can read about the other team because you kind of need to be informed. Well, if I didn't scare him away with my COVID brain already, um, Jenna Lane, ESPN, that's uh, Jenna, J-E-N-N-A, L-A-I-N-E, ESPN. That's on X, formerly known as Twitter. Um, I post on Facebook as well, because I know not everybody's on there. Um, starting to post on threads again, too. Kind of forgot about it, but I realized that not everybody wants to be on X. So, um, yeah, those are those are really kind of the ways to to follow me. I post a little bit on Instagram here and there, kind of daily updates as well. But that's kind of a mixture of work and life. So if you if you're cool with seeing some vacation photos from Greece, then sure, <laughs> you can follow that one as well. That's also Jenna Lane ESPN. Who doesn't love Greece, right? <laughs> there you go. Jenna, thank you very much. And I will see you this weekend. Thank you. That's it for this episode. Thanks to Jenna for joining me, and thank you, as always, for tuning in. Again, I'll be back on Saturday morning with another episode getting you ready for the season opener. Talk to you next time.